Good afternoon. My name is Steve Tseng. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. Let me first of all welcome you very warmly on behalf of SOAS and of its China Institute to the China Debate 2018. Um, as you may have noticed, there is a last minute change to the program. On the programs, you had been told that it would be Graham Hutchings who would be moderating the event this evening, but in fact, you have me. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, Graham was taken ill this morning, so he was unable to come to um, the debate today. The academic year 2017 to 2018, I think, is, an, is a particularly important year, perhaps not so much for SOAS, but for China. It is a year of a potential turning point. Well, at least I think it is a beginning of a new era. And I will explain why I think we are looking pot potentially at the beginning of a new era. To begin with, President Xi Jinping told us so at the 19th Party Congress and also reaffirmed at the National People's Congress last month, he had made it very clear. And now is officially in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China that the element which is known as Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in a new era is part of the Constitution. A new era is written right there in the Constitution. And in fact, I would say this is not just a formality. If we look at the kind of changes that Xi Jinping seems to be unleashing at the 19th Party Congress and then reaffirm at the NPC, we are probably genuinely seeing the beginning of a new era, or at least the intention that there will be a new era. Why do I say that? Well, until more or less now, we really were in the period of the, Xi Jinping, the uh, Deng Xiaoping era of reform and opening up. And in that period of reform and opening up, there were two things that mark that time. One was the kind of experimentalism that when the Chinese government, the Communist Party, was implementing the Deng Xiaoping era of reform and opening, they followed the principle of crossing the river by feeling for rocks underneath. It was one of experiment experimentation. In terms of foreign policy, we had China that was going to, and indeed for a long time, for three decades, hiding China's capabilities and biting for its time. At the 19th Party Congress, Xi Jinping articulated a bold new vision for China, that in 30 years' time, by the time the, PL, the um, PLC reaches its centenary, then there would be a rich, powerful, modern, and beautiful China, a China that would be second to none, a China that from now on expects to play, to take center stage in global affairs. It is a China that is quite different from the China that we saw uh, under Deng Xiaoping. And then, of course, that raises the issue of how sustainable is China's model? Well, to different people, the China models mean different things. You can look at it in terms of politics. You can look at it in terms of economics, in, in terms of social order or all of them and more. Well, that is in some sense a very important issue to be di discussed and debated today. But in a very important sense, the China model is also a model of authoritarian development. And there are many countries in this world which actually look to China and see the model in China as something that is very attractive to them that is something that they may like to follow. 
whether China's model is one to be followed or not, in a sense, will depend on whether it is actually sustainable. If it is rather less sustainable than other countries may think, they may like to think again. But if it is very sustainable, then perhaps they will genuinely see that it is something worth um, following. And the, and the Chinese authoritarian model comes in contrast to the more conventional Western liberal democratic development model. So it is something which I think is important and therefore it is a very good time for us to hold this debate uh, here at SOAS. Having said that, it is a very good subject to debate for us. I should perhaps also remind you that if we look at the same question in China, there's probably rather less concern about whether it's sustainable. Well, at least there is rather less concern about the sustainability of President Xi as leader of China. There's a clear widespread view now, I think, in China and indeed elsewhere that President Xi will be here for rather longer than the customary two terms adding up to 10 years. Perhaps one could go even as far as to say that there will be a President Xi as long as Xi Jinping is here with us. We don't know that yet, but the sustainability issue perhaps is not so much about whether Xi Jinping will be sustainable, but whether China's development model is indeed uh, sustainable. Well, to address all these issues, I'm delighted to pre present to you a very distinguished panel consisting of leading scholars from China, from the United States, and of course from the home team from the United <coughs> Kingdom. Of our panelists, I will introduce them in the order when they will give you the introductory uh, comments. The first to go will be Professor Xi Yan Hong. Professor Xi is a distinguished professor of international relations and the director of the Center for American Studies at Renmin University in Beijing. He has served as a counselor to the State Council of the PRC since February 2011. He has published 18 books and about 600 professional articles and essays. The second to speak is Professor Jane Duckett. She is the Edward Chart Chair of Politics and Director of the Scottish Centre for China Research at the University of Glasgow. A fellow of the British Academy and author of several very important and insightful books on China, her research interest includes works on Chinese state under market reform, a comparative study of public attitudes to openness in East Asian and Eastern Europe, and Eastern Europe, and also Chinese public policy. And the third to speak is Professor Nicholas Lardy. <coughs> Professor Lardy is the Anthony Solomon Senior Fellow at the Patterson Institute for International Economics. He was previously a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and was before that a professor and director of the Henry Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. A distinguished economist of China, he is the author or editor of eight books and again of numerous countless articles and essays on China. To round up the debate, we have Professor Ming Sing Pei. Professor Pei is the Tom and Margot Pariska, 1972 Professor of Government and the Director of the Kurt Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College in California. Is also a non residency senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He had previously served as director of the China program at, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and taught at Princeton University. Again, he is the author of several very weighty books and numerous articles, and is particularly well known for this evening 
for articulating the concepts, suggesting China is in a kind of a trapped transition and has a system that nurtures crony capitalism. So some of those issues perhaps would be uh, addressed. Well, let me remind you that the event this evening will be filmed and it will be put on a podcast, hopefully within a week or so. If you do not wish to be filmed, please let one of our staff, one of our student ambassadors know, and we will arrange for you to be seated in a corner where you are unlikely to be filmed. <laughs> now, if you have not done so, please put your mobile phone on silent I will not request you to switch your mobile phone off. Indeed, you are encouraged to share insights from the debate on the social media, and I think you will have the handles for various social media uh, on the screen. And if you are from SOAS or from another university, I think you will be able to connect to the Wi-Fi network automatically. If you are not from a university institution and not automatically log on to the educational roaming service, you can sign in from the SOAS Gaze Wi-Fi. Um, before I start the debate, I would like to ask you to give the panel a sense of whether you think the China model, however you understand it, is sustainable or not. So if those, for those of you who feel that the China model is sustainable, could you raise your hands? It's a very rough straw poll. Okay. This is the sustainable. It looks like a, le clearly less than a, a majority. Those of you who feel that is unsustainable, please. Right? Seems a, a bit more, but not necessarily that much more. But for those of you who have not decided, <laughs> right, against a bit less, so there's, there's some of you who clearly prefer not to indicate your wish at this stage, <laughs> which is absolutely fine. And I would also like to explain that at the end of the debate, I would like to ask you the same question, just to see it, get a sense of whether you might have changed your view, not individually, but collectively, uh, whether there is a significant change in views afterwards. Um, now, over to you, Professor Xi. Okay. Uh, it's my great honor to be here and with you all, and for which I would like to and sincerely thank and uh, SOIS, and especially Professor Director Deng. I think that uh, this is uh, a discussion. I don't think that if we and uh, speak, all speakers, in simple way, and uh, maybe you will, and uh, answer that finally China's model is sustainable or not sustainable. A soft KB understanding word or might increase reluctance to answer the question quickly. And about China's model and its sustainability. I will, will, I would like to uh, emphasize four points and make my tentative conclusion. Firstly, it should be differentiated between Chinese model and in both domestic and foreign policy pattern in the Chinese official discourse on one hand and that the international audiences can understand easily. We quickly found there is sameness and their difference. What is sameness? And sameness is that whether on Chinese official discourse or foreign orders, audience, and the booths, and uh, on the focusing of economic development and the political stability with environmental protection and social welfare. And if you deny, and the Chinese model now have these fundamental aspects, I don't think that you are very objective. But there is a difference. 
and the Chinese government often ignore it. And the difference uh, on the different emphasis upon policy called dictatorship, a political control, a free market, and opening to the Western world. And I think that the foreign audiences, the think of China model, are put more emphasis and on in China, and there is partly so-called dictatorship. And there are too much political control. There are less free market than desired, and maybe less opening to the Western world. Secondly, China's model should also be observed as a historical and evolutionary conception from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping. And its evolution as such could be discussed in terms of its inner tensions, especially those between commanding and the market elements of the economy. In Deng's year, and the marketing elements of the economy is more pro, uh, was more prominent, at least paid more attention by both Chinese people and foreign audiences. But now, and maybe more observa uh, observable, is the commanding elements of the economy. And also, between power centralization and decentralization. And Deng Xiaoping is so, was so famous for decentralization of power and uh, Xi Jinping in some way and is in opposite. And also between the soft and the hard. And Deng Xiaoping compared with now is soft generally. And Xi Jinping in this comparative framework is harder. Or foreign policy, prudently conservative and radically expansion foreign policy. And compared with now, Deng Xiaoping is undoubtedly have a foreign policy characterized by prudent conservative in incarnation. And the planet, of course, compared with Deng Xiaoping, radically expansion of foreign policy and he is correct. And uh, the China model is a planet version. Not historical version. It's of course largely Xi Jinping's dramatic product. And his innovation in politics. And I think Professor Deng and just mentioned it. And his innovation in economics, in social control, in military and foreign policy. Therefore, really he launched a new year. And third, it shall be differentiated between China's model in China and that supposedly in other developing countries. The issue of compatibility with local conditions, so-called local conditions in other developing countries, is prominent and for any cool-headed analysis. Critical points are very simple. There are no communist Ch Chinese Communist Party in other developing countries, let alone come China Communist Party under Xi Jinping in other developing countries. And generally, no applicable Chinese version of almost every sort of political control, highest centralization, and non-religious culture there. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, requirements for economic development, social stability, and even political stability, and opening up are generally the same in other developing countries and in China. And finally, and we should ask what problems China's model has solved and will solve in China, and what it has not yet solved and or could not or even would exaggerate problems also in China. The former includes high speed economic growth and rising of people's living standards in general, solid internal uh, political stability, great increase of national strength, and the country's international influence. <laughs> 
and Chinese people, let alone Chinese government, have been proud of this. Even many of them have, among people, have some different opinion on some aspects of the Chinese state look. But the later includes. This means that the, the, the problems is have not yet solved, or could not or even would agree. Social equality and fairness, transformation of excessive environment to driving pattern of Chinese economic growth, political liberalization, real rule by law, in the higher level of the state, sustainability of efficient so called one man's law, pluralistic political culture, and a strictly defined international soft power. Therefore, my conclusion, tentative conclusion, the issue of the sustainability of China's model is valid. So the contribution of the debate and the vital importance of that of international context in terms of the viability of Western or American model. And why people talk about so much about the China model, one reason is that Western model has been dark. And since 2008, and especially since, I'm sorry to say, Donald Trump, and uh, become American president. And the issue of dynamic competition to win hearts and minds in the world by both of these models. Perhaps each will win part. So the future of the world might be as messy as it is today. Thank you for your patience. Well, thank you very much, Professor Xi. Uh, Jane, Professor Decker. Thank you, Steve. Also, thank you for inviting me today. Um, OK. Yeah, yes. Is, is that on or off? I think it's off. This is on? Yeah. Is this on? That's on. The green light means it's on, right? Yeah. OK. OK, thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I think one of the issues we face here is the fact that the the China model is, is not something that's standing still, it's evolving. And as many people have noted in the past, um, you know, the adaptability of, of, of um, you know, the, the, the party state in China is one of the, one of the features of its longevity. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of begin by making that observation, but I want to pick up really on, on one aspect of the model um, that Professor Xu mentioned, which is around social welfare. I'm gonna focus in particular on that, because that's the, the area where I, where I feel I can uh, um, speak more um, from, from my own research. So I think that social policy and social provisions and social welfare is a really important part of the China model, and it's one that's often overlooked with a tendency to perhaps focus more on the political aspect, the political nature of the, of the model, and, and perhaps the economic as well. Um, now, as the, the, the social provisioning and social policy angle is something that's become more prominent and, and so is part of this evolving and adapting model. It's been particularly important, I think, to the model, to the, to the regime in China since at least the late 1990s, over the last 20 years. And I think it's important for two kind of reasons. And one is, one is that it, it contributes to the legitimacy of the current political system. Uh, in the sense that, or, and that's one of the aims of, the, of these social policies. So the Chinese government has been expanding its social provision, its social welfare and its social security systems in an attempt, I think, to enhance the, the, their legitimacy. It's not the only reason, however, um, having looked in, in detail at some of the, the, the policy decision-making around the turn of the 21st century, if you look very carefully, you can see that economic considerations are all also really important. And, and it, um, building social provisioning, building social welfare, tackling poverty, extending social programs such as rural pensions and rural health insurance and so forth, um, trying to uh, improve housing and provide um, social housing. These initiatives, um, whether successful or not, and I'll talk about that in a moment, these have all been seen as important to contributing to future economic uh, growth and development, and in some cases, in the rural case, some of those social policies contributing to you know, the, 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 the rural consumer and the creation of the rural 
consumer and consumer-led growth from the countryside. So I think it is an important part. Um, so I've, I've indicated some of the areas in which we, we see that social policies have, have, uh, have been introduced. Also an indicator, I think, of um, the, the regime's commitment to improving, or at least its stated commitment to improving social welfare and so forth, it has, and, and, and people's lives has been around attempts to tackle poverty. And of course, one of China's great achievements and one for which it's regularly um, lauded in, in, international, in international settings on the international stage is for its reductions in poverty. Um, and so where we have, the world, according to the World Bank, where we had maybe nearly 70% of the population living in poverty, if we, on the measure of just under $2 a day, in, in around 1990, we now only have about 1% in that position. So a huge, huge reduction in, um, in poverty, in, in absolute poverty in China. Um, and Xi Jinping currently stating that he wants to eradicate absolute poverty by 2020. So the current, the current um, leadership, very keen to pursue that um, um, and has other sort of major targets as well. So setting the bar quite high for the future in terms of currently saying that they want to achieve the level of high income countries, rich countries, um, in terms of uh, life expectancy, infant mortality rates and um, maternal mortality rates by 2030. So really kind of continually setting quite ambitious targets, I feel, and targets that may be difficult, in fact, to meet. So, um, so I think that the ambitions are there. There are, of course, huge problems. And on the, on the negative side, a lot of the programs that have been rolled out are, um, in many ways, extremely regressive in the sense that they provide most generously for the wealthiest people in China and least um, generously for the poorest. And this remains a big problem. Um, one of the questions going forward is, as, as the, the leadership has kept raising its investment in these programs, it's kept sort of uh, the, the, the share of GDP committed to social spending has risen consistently over the last decade or decade and a half. Um, but it's still well below OECD levels. I think the last figure that I've had seen available is um, social spending, pu public social spending as a share of GDP is, is um, at least 9%, probably a bit more now. Um, but it's going it, to, OECD, level, OECD levels are around 22%. So it's still far below, below that. And I, I, so I think I would, I'd, I'd probably finish by saying, to the, to the extent, and we can discuss this, this social, social policy is important to the sustainability of the overall model, and I think it might be in terms of its contribution to future economic growth, um, in terms of producing an educated and skilled workforce for the future, for example. Um, I think um, the, the question is, can, can the government continue to roll out and actually improve and overcome these regressive policies? And I think Xi Jinping, one, one of the his claims at the moment is that you need a strong and centralized political system in order to overcome some of the vested interests that there are, there have been in the, in the model as it's been that he's trying to move forward. So the big question really uh, is whether or not he can actually overcome those particular vested interests in order to build a more equitable social security and social, social uh, welfare system um, that, will, that will support economic and social development in the future. Thank you very much. Two very nuanced views, and if I could invite you, Nick, Professor Ladi. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me. I'd like to begin by underlining what Jane said, and that is uh, China's model at least as I understand it, is far from static, particularly when you look at the economic dimensions. And I'll just look at it from the point of view of the labor force. When reform began 40 years ago, 99.8% of the workforce was in collectives, which were heavily state controlled, or in state enterprises, or directly for the government in, in the bureaucracy. Today, state enterprises only employ about 10% of the workforce. All of the growth of employment in urban China outside of agriculture 
since 1978 has come from the expansion of private businesses. So you had an economy that was, all the employment was in the state sector. Basically 100% of GDP was coming out of the state sector. Today, only about a fourth of China's total output is being produced by state companies. So there's been a tremendous transformation in, reflected in the rise of private business, both in terms of employment and in terms of its contribution to output. So I think when we talk about the China model, we have to begin by recognizing that, it, at least in the economic terms, it is far from static. The second point I would like to make is that I think from a narrow economic point of view, we are seeing a shift uh, towards a much more sustainable model. Whether it will last for any particular period of time, I'm not uh, prepared to say, but they've moved from a model where growth was generated primarily by investment and exports to a situation in which most growth is being generated by increased uh, consumption. This ties back into Jane's uh, point about the um, growth of, of private income uh, and so forth. So we're, we're moving from a model where investment and exports were the most important sources of growth towards one in which consumption is far and away the most important source of growth and almost all of that consumption is private consumption as opposed to government consumption. And looking at it from the production perspective, we have moved away from a model that was very dependent on the growth of the industrial sector, which produced all the capital goods for the investment and produced almost all the exports, towards a model in which services have become the biggest driver from the production point of view, the biggest driver of China's uh, economic growth. And there's a long way to go in this transition. Services are still, uh, you know, they're a little over half of GDP. They will rise over time to something like 70 or 75 percent of GDP. And I think this will be driven by what we've seen in the labor market. The private sector has generated most of the jobs and wages are rising fairly rapidly. Uh, this is the only major economy in the world where the wage share of total output is rising, the profit share is going down. If you look at the average of the OECD countries, it's fairly, fairly flat. So I think they're moving towards a much more sustainable model of economic growth, whether you look at it from the income perspective, the production uh, <coughs> perspective, or from the expenditure uh, perspective. And the third point I would like to make is, is, again, to reinforce what Jane said, I think the model also is much more sustainable socially than it was in the past, as reflected by a very substantial uh, build-out of the social safety net. Um, here I would point out, over the last 15 years, China's expenditures on education, health, uh, and other programs have been growing by more than 20% per year. It's the fastest rate of growth of any middle income or upper middle income economy in the world. And I think here's where I would disagree slightly with what Jane said. Of course, China isn't going to have the same kind of social programs as the average of the OECD. The average OECD country has a per capita income that is four to five times uh, that of China. Uh, I think China is doing better at building out the social safety net and providing uh, services. They're doing better than any other uh, country at the same, roughly the same level of economic development. Um, and I just give one specific example of the resources the government has put into this program. Uh, Jane mentioned the Rural Cooperative Healthcare Scheme, which is a genuinely cooperative program. The government puts in money and the individuals put in money if you want to participate. When this program began on an experimental basis a few years ago, well, 15 years ago, I think is more accurate, the government was putting in 40 renminbi per person. Individuals were putting in 20. Um, last year, the government was putting in 420 RMB per person. This is a genuine insurance scheme where the, the contributions are pooled and then used to reimburse uh, expenditures that individuals incur either for outpatient care or inpatient care. And originally, the amounts of money were so small that the reimbursement rates were t tending to be something like 20, 30 percent. Now the reimb average reimbursement rates are going up to 70, 80 percent. 
because the, the level of government input into this program has uh, grown so substantially. There are, I mean, many people are beginning to say, uh, given uh, the likelihood that fiscal revenue growth may slow down, that this may become unsustainable, but I think the government is pretty committed to improving uh, services in this area. Uh, this is not a government, obviously, that stands for popular elections, but I think when they see a program that has gotten such a positive response, they're probably going to continue it. So the model's not, uh, not static. I think they're moving in a more sustainable direction economically, and I think they've done an outstanding job, really, in terms of social services for a, an economy at China's level of per capita development. Thank you very much. A well thought through positive view. Uh, I've noticed that some of you have arrived late and are sitting on the steps. There are some seats in front, so please feel free to move to the front and sit more comfortably. And in the meantime, I'll hand over to Ming Sing, Professor Bay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, first, uh, I think there's some agreement uh, 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 as this panel is that. Uh, uh, the China model actually is not static, it's dynamic. And uh, if you uh, think about it, the China model that we know about m most well is actually dead. And that is the most successful China model if you uh, look at its record. And this is the so-called post Tiananmen political order in China. And let me summarize what it is. And you can even extend that to cover the 1980s, the Deng Xiaoping period. That is, this is a model that emphasized China's integration with the world. It emphasized the decentralization of power. It emphasized liberalization of the economy. It uh, emphasized, uh, it focused on a pragmatic, low profile foreign policy. It also politically uh, uh, instituted a form of collective leadership. Uh, this a model produced the so-called China economic miracle. But five years ago, uh, there was a real political change in China. And as a result of that change, uh, what we know about that model, not very little of it actually remains. What China has today is a completely different approach practic to practically on every uh, uh, skull. That is, you have centralization of power, you have a much more assertive, aggressive foreign policy, uh, you have economic nationalism, which uh, uh, emphasizes China's uh, national economic interest, even at expense of integration with the rest of the world. And that's why China's relationship with its major trading powers is probably at its worst in decades. So the real question is whether this new China model will be sustainable. Uh, on this, I think we only have history to uh, refer to as some kind of source of uh, judgment. Is that we don't know about the future. I think the honest answer to this question is we don't know, but how many academics would openly admit their ignorance, right? Uh, uh, but also uh, in thinking about the future of this new sustainable model, we, only, uh, we can answer this question. Uh, has there been a successful dictatorship, one party regime, that has managed to reach high income level? High income level, uh, or the status of high income, uh, is defined by the World Bank as half per capita GDP in PPP terms, purchasing power parity, at half of the leading country in the world. So at today, the leading country is the US, uh, about $58,000 PPP. China's uh, PPP is about 13000 so about roughly a quarter. Uh, so in other words, uh, will China be able to double its per capita income in the next whatever eight years and reach that status level. In global history, there's not a single dictatorship that has achieved that level. So in other words, history is stacked up against China for very profound, difficult, uh, 
complex reasons we can explore that. But if you look at this, it's not a single uh, dictatorship. And Singapore is not a dictatorship. Let's just give Singapore uh, the proper uh, uh, title it deserves. Singapore actually has legitimate opposition parties, it's rule of law, uh, it has a lot more f personal freedom, economic free freedom than Chinese. If China is actually governed like Singapore, then I have absolutely no uh, uh, doubt that it will be uh, successful. Uh, so history, so China has this history to, act the historical record to contend. And also we should not forget that China's past success, the, uh, the last 35 years or 40 years, uh, depended a great deal on its external environment, in, uh, uh, especially a stable, cooperative, beneficial relationship with the U.S. And those who have been watching the development of U.S.-China relations, I think most of them would have conclude that their relationship has turned. So in the years ahead, China's external environment will be most likely much less favorable than what it was in the last 40 years. So if you put history, international uh, environment, and then uh, the, the, also within China, the record of one man rule, this form of centralized power uh, is not very encouraging. I think we only, uh, we only have to refer to the Maoist period to know how successful that kind of system is. So on, the, on balance, uh, even though I, uh, I uh, tend to be receptive to the idea of ignorance, uh, but uh, I'm actually more confident than uh, most people that this is not going to be a successful, sustainable system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for putting a very clear views on the more skeptical side of this debate. I am not going to start off by asking the most skeptical to disagree with the most positive. I'm going to start with a more neutral uh, question somewhere in the middle. I think Jane made a, a, a comment which essentially says that the success of China's reform and its reform agenda to be pursued it will require a strong leadership. And if that strong leadership is not there, then it's going to be much more difficult. Would you agree? And um, do feel free to interrupt each other if you want to in the course of the discussions. Uh, Nick, would you like to get started? Is it necessary for your economic success? I mean, to have more centralization and more centralization, and stronger leadership. And Xi Jinping has now the strongest possible leadership since certainly since Deng Xiaoping and arguably since after Mao Dai. Well, I'll be the honest academic and, and say I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think you can point in different directions. Obviously, if, if she goes off in the, in the erratic uh, policy directions, at least in the economic domain and to a certain extent in the cultural and political domains that we saw under Mao Zedong, then China, China, we can write China off uh, as, a, as a model and a su successful uh, developing economy. Um, I simply don't know. I mean, there are optimists who think, yes, now she's consolidated his political power. He's run his anti-corruption campaign. Now he's going to go back to this very uh, ambitious economic reform agenda that was laid out in uh, the third plan in, in November of 2013, a document that people claim, I wasn't there, so I don't know, people claim that she was guiding the pen on that document, and it's a and by Chinese standards, it's a revolutionary document from an economic perspective. But very little of that has been actually implemented. So the optimists say, okay, now he's gotten rid of a lot of his political enemies. He's revised the Constitution so he can stay in power indefinitely. So now he's going to turn to economics. I hope that's true, uh, but I, I'm not prepared to make that argument because I don't see too much evidence that that is the case. The one really important piece of evidence I think comes on the personnel side and that is in the economic and particularly in the financial domain at the National People's Congress uh, a few couple, two or three weeks ago we did see the appointment of some very good people to run the central bank uh, to run this newly reorganized combined regulatory agency that is going to deal with both banking uh, and insurance we had uh, Liu He getting promoted. We had Wang Yang, who I think is a reformer, moving from vice premier to 
Standing Committee of the Poet Bureau. A lot, I mean, I hesitate to say this with Minchin <laughs> present, because he will probably find some counterexamples, but a lot of the appointments, at least from my perspective, indicate uh, a, a possible reform agenda, certainly a leadership that is uh, giving uh, key positions to people that have argued systematically for uh, economic reform. So maybe these people are going to be given uh, some leeway and maybe with Xi Jinping in a stronger position, the vested interests that Jane mentioned who thwarted a lot of these reforms will have to give in and be pushed aside. So I don't really know, but um, I'm hoping we'll see more on the, on the economic reform. She would like to come in. Okay, I, I cannot agree with you know a simple conception that the the make uh, Chinese political leadership since opening and reform uh, into a dichotomy, and a simple conception that Xi Jinping is only only Xi Jinping is a strong leadership, and I don't think that the Deng Xiaoping is a reformist strong leader. Jiang Zemin is a little less reformist, but still strong leader. Only Hu Jintang is not less reformist and much weak leader. <laughs> so what China requires for its progress and for its as well stability is a reformist strong leader. So this is not only you know, strong, strong, strongness is only requirement. And of course, and the China reform and opening already now this year is for its 40th anniversary. We have almost and uh, the, 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 the 30 years and the China reform and economic development and, uh, and foreign policy as well. Generally on the reformist strong leadership, Deng Xiaoping and in a little less degree Jiang, uh, Jiang Zemin. And Xi Jinping now is in his sixth year. And of course, he's a very strong leader, all powerful strong leader. But whether he is at the same time fully reformist, and we still have to wait and see. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, if, if a country has been reforming for 40 years and is still reforming, I think something has to be wrong with the reform process itself. So when people talk about China reform, I say, what reform? Uh, so uh, in terms of political strengths, I think it really depends on where the guy is going, where the leader, the strong leader is leading the country. Uh, if you have relatively weak leadership, but the overall direction is still correct, and then uh, it's really a matter of the pace of progress. But if you have a very strong leader but he's leading the country in the wrong direction, then probably strength is not what we would like to see in that kind of leadership. Jane, would you like to come in? Yeah, I'd like to come in in, in part because, in part because um, I, I, I didn't say China needs a strong leader, but I said that the arguments that are put forth in China for a strong, she as a strong leader are, are that he can you know, tackle these vested interests. Whether, whether or not um, he can in, in these social policies, I think, you know, I don't know either. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he can, but he hasn't done it yet. And in coming back to the issue of those kind of the, the, the positives on social policy, I mean, the spending's going up, but the problem is it's, it's still extremely regressive. So too much of the spending is, is going on and, and so sort of further improving the, bene, you know, the policies that benefit the, the, the wealthier part of the population. To really shift that is going to hurt um, and there's going to be a lot of opposition. Now she has actually demonstrated in some areas through the corruption, anti-corruption campaign that he can and, and, and will sometimes take on the elite in the country. Um, so maybe, maybe he can do it, but I, I, I don't know. Okay, let's move on and then I'd like to raise the question um, that, in fact, Ming Sing put on the table, which is that he said China's success depends on the existence of a benign external environment. And he is having some question as to whether the external environment is, will be as benign as previously. Um, what are we going to be expecting in terms of that environment for China's to developed. Will the ex external environment still be benign? 
Well, I think it's, uh, it's an open question at this point. I certainly think there's a lot of rhetoric coming out of Washington that suggests that um, you know, things are pretty quickly going off the track. Uh, on the other hand, President Trump throws out a lot of things just to get a stronger negotiating position. And it may be that he will find the Chinese make a few concessions that are not very big and he will declare victory as he has already in the case of the renegotiated uh, bilateral trade agreement between the United States and Korea. Um, I'm not forecasting this, but I'm saying it's, it's a possibility that one can't rule out. The second point I would make is that it was kind of implicit in what I said earlier, and that is China is a much less export-oriented economy than it was uh, prior to the global financial crisis. It is, Growth is being driven more by domestic demand, and the simple metric that economists tend to look at is, you know, what, what are exports relative to GDP? And China was, I don't remember the exact numbers, they were up in the 30-some percent, now they're in the 20-some percent. So exports as a share of GDP have declined quite substantially over the last uh, decade. And so if the worst scenario emerges in terms of a collapse of globalization and uh, the demise of the WTA, WTO and some of the other things that have been mentioned in Washington. Uh, China certainly will suffer. It'll be a tougher environment, but they're nowhere near as vulnerable uh, to a development like that than they were uh, 10 years ago. Well, Professor Xi, you are China's leading expert on American studies. What do you say? I think that I refuse again, simply the answer from Xi Jinping and from China's Communist Party and even from People's Republic of China's perspective. In one fundamental aspect, the environment, international environment, become much more, much more benign to the party regime and to China model. And for example, I think the party had undergone its greatest, greatest difficulty in 1989 at the time Within China, even major people, majority of people think that the, the moon in New York and Brussels is more round than in China. But now no one can see this. This greatly increased the legitimacy and self-confidence of Chinese Communist Party, and including Xi Jinping, and to insist on their fundamental, you know, load or models. But, but on the other hand, and in the past, most of the past 40 years, China enjoyed the liberal globalization, which widespread perceiving China a fundamental beneficial for China. But now, this liberal globalization is losing a large part of its domestic social basis or political basis in advanced countries, especially in the United States and in some other few maybe European countries. On the other hand, in a strategic front you look at, China dramatically rise, including its military strengths. Finally, we mobilize our antagonists. And the United States mobilized to checking on China strategically, along with its allies, especially Japan. So I think that the, the falling environment is very complicated. And on one hand, become even more benign. On the other hand, become much more challenging, and even in some degree brutal. I don't think that the, maybe Chinese leaders and Chinese elite opinion is very prepared for the former, but they really and quite underprepared for the later aspect I just mentioned. Thank you. Ming Seng, are you persuaded? In oh, oh, yes, uh, I think in terms of external environment, we have to uh, think, uh, think in almost a uh, worst case scenario. That is, even though I think the Chinese uh, export dependence has fallen, it is still a huge chunk. We're talking about roughly 22% of its, 20% uh, of its GDP uh, is derived from exports. It's China exports something like $2.4 trillion. So it's, it's a huge amount. And a lot of that is because of China's central position as the center of global supply chain. And suppose a form of Cold War between China and the US. 
and that global supply chain will have to be restructured so that it will bypass China. And China's export will take a huge hit if, if that's the case. Uh, and also China will have to spend a lot more on its military expenditures in order to compete with the US uh, in the security area. So if the external strategic environment really deteriorates, the uh, economic impact will be substantial. Uh, and it's not just the US. I think what's uh, uh, need to be said uh, 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 is that uh, Europe, the US, and later on Japan have all come to the same conclusion that their engagement policy with China has failed to deliver the desired results. And it is time for a fundamental shift. We don't know the, what specific policies will come out of this assessment, but in the next five, 10 years, a, a much more uh, robust policy, a very different policy, much more confrontational policy is likely. Uh, and if that policy is put into place, uh, uh, there has to be, there will be, unavoidably, consequences on the economic front. Okay. I will now open the floor, and if you would not mind um, standing up when I call on you so that the Syrian ambassadors can identify you and hand you with a microphone, if you could also very, very briefly, one sentence explaining who you are, uh, then we would enable the speakers, the panelists to know. I think uh, the gentleman in the suit, that's Christopher, that's you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My tailor will be delighted. Um, I think Xi Jinping has said many times that the future of the Chinese economy in particular is dependent on science and innovation. None of the speakers have mentioned this. And there's a corollary question here, very important, very simple. Where are the top brains in the world going to migrate to? We live in a world of extraordinary international fluidity. The top people, not merely in science, but in finance, services, government, everything. And they move very quickly. We've seen this recently. Even Mrs. Merkel can't get the bankers to go from London to Frankfurt. Quite an attractive place. Will the innovators, scientists, want to stay in China? That is the question. I'm not answering it, but that is the question. Thank you. Who would, would you like to get started with that one, uh, Professor Xi? If, if a more authentic voice from China. Yeah, will, will, the science, will the scientists, will the dynamic people, will the in innovators in China stay in China? No, no. Nick? It's a, it's a very tough question to answer, but I think um, from what we've seen in a lot of domains, China is leading in innovation and in artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, potentially uh, 5G technology, and China has an enormous pool of talented people, mostly working for private companies that are driving innovation uh, in many domains. But they're not doing it in isolation. There's a flow of people back and forth between China and Silicon Valley and other centers of innovation in the West. Uh, a lot of Chinese investment going into Silicon Valley firms. So I think a lot of this innovation is global in nature, but I think the Chinese are playing an increasingly important role. Yeah, uh, uh, I want to point out two hurdles. One is this flow of uh, talent and information between China and the outside world. Probably it will uh, uh, be uh, blocked to substantial degree by the worsening strategic relationship between China and the US. And uh, one of the priorities of the US administration is to dramatically limit China's capacity to gain technology from the US. So even though specific measures have not been proposed uh, based on the record of uh, the U.S. government blocking Chinese acquisition of tech companies. The record is very clear. The direction is very clear. So that's one. The other is what's happening in China. I think the biggest problem for anybody who wants to move China is their internet access, right? It's not just them, their children. And uh, uh, they will feel living in a very different world. How can they, uh, uh, how do they deal with uh, 
a system which views the flow of information and personal freedom as a form of existential threat to the party state. Uh, so this, I, uh, I want to relay an anecdote. I don't know whether it's true or not, probably it's true that six year, uh, five years, uh, three years ago, uh, the Chinese government convened a very high level uh, national conference on science and technology. Six of the seven top leaders showed up and they gave uh, very uh, glowing speeches, encouraging speeches on why China should innovate and lead. And uh, during the Q&A, uh, a, a very distinguished senior uh, academician in the Science Academy stood up and said, I have a problem. That is, if you want us to innovate, but you don't let us use the internet freely, how can we innovate? And there was this huge round of applause. And of course, he didn't get a clear answer from China's top leaders. Okay, uh, Nian Hong. Oh, China for, for, for technology innovation in China in the first place have a huge advantage. This is China's size. And a lot in China every year produce and, uh, from university, graduate from university and hundreds of thousands engineers. And another example is that the, 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 the every year in China's excellent students and uh, go to overseas. And uh, many of them in first rate universities and uh, including London, London University. And uh, at least 20% or 30% will return to China especially on the recent years, the government, huge, you know, the incentives economically and in terms of position and so and so. And also, and I think that the Chinese government, especially Xi Jinping himself, and among his comrades have the keenest sense to go to in this direction. But on the other hand, China still have some, you know, substantial weakness, which could discount the advantage I just mentioned. The first is that in China, and why so many Chinese excellent students well and uh, go to, especially for graduate, graduate courses, and go to overseas. Because in Chinese university generally, I see in Chinese political and uh, social life, they are too much confirmist culture. And are not so encourage debate and personal initiative and creative. And of course, and, uh, commanding economic elements, government you know, promotion could overcome and this kind of you know, problems, but only partially. The second is that the Chinese government maybe and in the future will be better. Chinese leaders, m most of them, and up to now, graduate from engineers. And so they pay a lot of attention to te new technologies strictly defined, but they pay much less attention to, you know, so-called the, the, the management of people and management of finance. And he himself recently said that we should should accelerate the process to, to transform China's national strength into our managing capability in global stage. This means that in the later sense, we are relatively weak. And third is, of course, and there is no purely economic technology problem. This world is governed by political economy. And the United States, and in less degree, and some European countries, and in Japan, and because for strategic purpose, they now realized and uh, keenly that the, to, 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 to slow this process of China escalating into world, you know, high level technology, technology is the one of the most important strategic issues. So, and uh, Trump's high tariff and other, you know, equal punishment threats and is generally and, uh, concentrated on those industries and which and most closely connected with next generation of technology. Thank you. Jane, 
briefly, perhaps. Yeah, just really briefly. I know you want to move on. Um, I would agree that, you know, well, I would say some people will obviously stay, and that's partly because there's a lot of investment, as I think you said, and some people won't stay. Some people would prefer to be in a, in a freer environment. But I would, I would say there's a, there's a paper came out actually just a few, I think a couple of months ago, which was a study of returned... Um, so, so it was a study of scientists in China on this exact question. I think it was mainly chemists. And a lot of them did say that they found the environment somewhat less advantageous in terms of the sort of the freedoms and the, and the, the sort of the, the, ed, the innovative environment, the, the sort of educational training and innovative environment. But they did also appreciate the investment. So I think, you know, that, that, so, so, so for some people, um, it, despite the problems, that they, this was a study of people who are still in China. So some people, despite the problems, were still, were still there. Whether they're the very best is another matter. Um, I'll take I'll take one on this other side, and I'll take one in the in the middle if I if I if I could. If everybody could be very succinct, including our panelists, we might be able to be squeeze in two. Um, the lady there, please. Hi, I'm an alumnus from SOAS, um, Chinese in law. My question is: um, We talked a lot about the U.S. and a bit of uh, about Europe. What are your views in the last sort of five years on foreign Chinese foreign policy on the African continent, or in like the development of like big infrastructure um, projects in Iran, and whether you would assess this as a success for the future, or something a bit more nefarious and and a danger uh, globally? Thank you. Okay, who would like to take that one on first? <laughs> we, we don't have to go through all, all around the table. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I won't comment on Africa since I, I'm not really following the Chinese activities there, but on the, on the broader question of the Chinese Belt and Road and how that's working, um, yeah, I think we're still at a very early stage. There's a lot of talk about a trillion dollars or more, but the amounts of money that have actually been spent are much, much smaller and we don't have enough of a track record. I mean, this program really began only five years ago to judge whether or not the projects are gonna be successful. Remember, they're all mostly financed by Chinese loans. Every time I read in a Chinese, uh, any newspaper that the Chinese are investing in the Belt and Road, as an economist, I get, I get angry because uh, they're lending money, and maybe if the borrowers all default, it will turn into a Chinese investment, but that's certainly not their intention, but I think that's, that's the greatest uh, downside from the Chinese if the projects are not carefully designed, carefully chosen, carefully implemented, that they will end up with a lot of projects that uh, are not viable. Uh, some of the governments in these countries, uh, even though they may guarantee the projects, are probably not in a position to do so. The IMF is already warning that some of the countries in the Belt and Road uh, program already have excessive external uh, debt and they should not be encouraged to uh, borrow more. Okay. Perhaps we press on. Uh, you, you could focus your questions on the issue of sustainability. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes. Um, George Magnus, I'm a research associate here at SOAS and also at the China Center in Oxford. Um, the uh, I didn't put my hand up when you asked the question about sustainability, Steve, because <clears throat> I thought it was only a marginally better question than the referendum question we had a couple of years ago. <laughs> <clears throat> we can talk about that later. Um, but seriously, because A, it wasn't kind of time constraints. So I didn't know whether you meant for 10 years or 100 years. Um, but also, it just struck me that actually the, the key issue really is we, we all know how successful, remarkably successful, uniquely successful China has been during the last 20 or 30 years. And the idea that we can kind of take that and say that we can extrapolate that into the future, I think personally that that's kind of finished now. So the governance system has changed as Professor Ming Xin Pei um, uh, eloquently explained. And it seemed to me that at the 19th Congress, one of the big takeaways from that was the change in the central contradiction. Now, if, if everything in action actually backed up the rhetoric of that change in the central contradiction, then I think we could feel very comfortable. But I'd like to ask the panel about other contradictions, which I think have not really been mentioned or have only been kind of skirted over. The first is, 
How do you reconcile the maintenance of a growth target with deleveraging? And that's, I think, one of the big issues, it's certainly in the near term. The second question is, how do you reconcile all of the advantages of having a big population with the fact that China is the fastest aging country on the planet? And um, uh, obviously, Jane's comments about social welfare and social um, and the aggressive nature of, 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 the, uh, of the benefit system, I think, is really important there. Um, you know, the third is about productivity, which is a sort of a shortcoming, which not only has kind of gone missing in the West, but obviously it's gone missing in China too. And the fourth question really is about... <laughs> uh, well, you say that, but actually if you look at total factor productivity, which is the thing that most economists look at, um, it's uh, basically um, at a snail's pace in China, and it's very, very highly correlated with reform, which is also uh, stalled, as Professor Lardy said as well. And the last question really uh, builds on... I think, I think we okay. run it off. Those three will do for now. <laughs> Sorry. Well, there are a number of very good questions there. And Nick, because there's quite a lot of them on, on the uh, economic side, perhaps you could get started. Yeah. Yes, I'll just be very brief and, and take the first, uh, maybe it was the second contradiction about uh, deleveraging versus growth. Uh, I'm a relative optimist here. The Chinese have succeeded in bringing down the rate of growth of credit quite significantly over the last, about the last year and a half, and the growth has not slowed down. Uh, I think they are reducing financial risk because the chains of lending through non-bank financial institutions and all the rest of it are shrinking, but the credit that's reaching the real economy has not slowed down that much. So they've been able to bring down credit to GDP uh, from its peak in the third quarter of 2016, and as we saw last year, the growth of the economy actually ticked up a little bit. So, uh, so far, so good. I think that Leaders in Beijing now worry most is not uh, relatively slower, a little slower growth rate. They are very much worried about in the past two years the financial delicacy. And the financial risk is really remarkably increased. The second problem, and I think that they are not saying so much but still and is adamant to be adjusted for many years. And in despite of so-called to, 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 to make the poorest and portion of the population, which is definitely a small minority and, uh, and emancipated by poverty, the, among the, the majority of people and the social gap, income gap, is still increasing. And uh, I don't think that since Deng Xiaoping and Sui Jiang Zemin Hu Jintao and even Xi Jinping himself, any of the leaders, and take a very strong and systematic and measure and to, you know, shorten remarkably the social gap. Social gap is still expanding. I think that this could influence negatively long-term sustainability of China's model within China. Thank you. Um, Ming Sen. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, I'm glad you raised productivity and aging issue. Indeed, China today is the fastest aging uh, society in the world. Let me just throw out two numbers. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, the increase of 65 years uh, and older uh, portion of the population grew about 15 uh, basis points, at 0.15% a year. Today, it is 06 so four times faster. China is only about 15 years behind Japan in turn in its demographic curve. So in uh, what Japan, what you see in Japan today with 24% of its population 65 years older is what China is going to look like in the early part of 2030s. So this is, uh, and that drives down growth. The other is the productivity growth. There's a good reason for it to be slow, because the Chinese economy is transitioning into a service sector, service-oriented economy, and the service-oriented economy is going to have much lower productivity growth because of the nature of the activities in the service sector. So uh, if you think about a high-growth economy based on what China has done in the last 30-some-odd years, 
that kind of economy is no longer what we have in China today. It's going forward, it's a very different economy. Well, thank you very much. I am afraid that we have been defeated by the clock. Um, <laughs> the fault is, of course, entirely mine because I'm the one who's moderating. But I do apologize to those of you who are not able to uh, have your questions or comment. Um, before I draw this to a close, could I ask you to raise your hand if you have changed your mind in terms of whether you think it's sustainable or not sustainable. It doesn't matter whether you originally start thinking that it was sustainable and become unsustainable or the other way around. If you have changed your mind as a result of this discussion, could you raise your hands? So, <laughs> so very few of you have changed your, your mind on, 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 that, on that basis. I think in that case, we don't, we don't need to ask the three questions separately. Um, just let me thank our panelists and also thank you for this very interesting um, evening of discussions and debate. I think it is an important subject that we will be coming back to. It's something that I think uh, we never really expected to have a clear-cut answer one way or the other or clear-cut uh, decision as to whether it's sustainable or not. But it is going to be a quick, big issue that we will have to be uh, revisiting time and time again because of its sheer importance. Um, at the end of this debate, uh, we have a reception and you are all invited, and that is in the Brunei suite on the ground floor of this building. So at the end of this, if we could all move upstairs, please don't try to uh, buttonholes the speakers because they will be at the reception and they will be there available to talk to you. So thank you very much.